Lewis. <laughs> We move now to talk about this new book. Uh, this book, uh, the book we're celebrating today, has been a labor of love. It's a true Agia baby, and it is interdisciplinary. The idea was born in 2015 on a beach in Malta. Back then, Julia Hauser and I escaped one of the panels of Agia Conference in Malta, Fluid Nature, Fluid Cultures, Malta and the Mediterranean. We decided to exchange ideas on a beach whose name I remember now was also related to food, right, Julia? Ein to fear. Ein to fear. Ein to fear. Ein to fear. Uh, new AGA members, my advice, don't feel bad skipping panels and conferences if you come up with an idea for a conference and then a book. Kirill, Kirill Dimitriov, Julia Hauser, and I, as editors, would like to thank the German Ministry of Education and Research, BMBF. AGIA, of course, and the AGIA German office for their unfailing emotional, material, and administrative support. The BMBF subsidized the book, and we managed to convince the prestigious publisher, Brill, to publish a paperback copy of it together with the hardcover volume. Uh, those of you who know Brill know that this is actually very difficult. We thank the directors and staff of the Orient Institute Beirut and the Food Heritage Foundation Lebanon. We thank Brigitte, Brigitte Kanan. Uh, and Charles Perry for introducing us to the rich history and delightful flavors of a Basset cuisine. We thank AUB and its community of scholars, to whom I belong, of course, especially Provost Hrajli and President Khouri for the hospitality and support. I thank Aida Abbas for administrative help during the conference and my PhD student, Ricardo Paridi, for his work on the index. Thank you all. We are also in debt to Catherine Feidish for her careful proofreading of the chapters to Brill publishers, of course, also for showing an interest in our book project, and finally, to all contributors to this volume and at the conference itself for devoting their scholarly energies to the humble yet universally meaningful subject of food. Finally, we'd like to thank Dr. Rebecca Earle and Dr. Nawal, Saad, uh, Nawal, Dr. Becker, Dr. Nawal Rasallah for agreeing to introduce this book and for, that, for traveling all the way to Beirut to be with us today. Thank you. Julia. So I'm glad to introduce to you uh, professor Rebecca Earl, who is a, a professor of history and specifically recently of food history at the University of, of Warwick in uh, the United Kingdom. Rebecca Earl is interested in how ordinary everyday cultural practices such as eating shape how we think about the world. And she has been engaged with the topic of food since her third book, The Body of the Conquistador, which explores the centrality of food and eating to the construction of colonial space across the Spanish Indies in the early modern age. Currently, she is working on another very interesting project related to food. She is writing a global history of the potato and uh, thereby uh, investigating not just the potato as a product of globalization, but also the potato as a lens onto how states actually came to regulate what kind of foods their citizens should eat. So she traces that process through the potato. And so she's really an ideal expert to, to uh, discuss our book tonight. And I'm very grateful that she could make it here. Please help me welcome Professor Rebecca O. And I have the pleasure to welcome our uh, also distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Nawal Nasrallah. Dr. Nasrallah is an independent Iraqi scholar, passionate about cooking and its history and culture 
and an award-winning researcher and food writer. The first edition of her cookbook, Delights from the Garden of Eden, a cookbook and the history of the Iraqi cuisine published in 2003, is a winner of the Gourmand, uh, Gourmand World uh, Cookbook Awards. Her book, Dates, a Global History, uh, published, uh, released in uh, 2011, is a charming account of the date palm and its fruit, informative and fun to read. Her English translation of Ibn Sayyar al-Warraq's 10th century Baghdadi cookbook, Kitab al-Tabikh, entitled Annals of the Caliph's Kitchen, it's published uh, with Brill also, 2007, was awarded best translation in the world and best of the best of the past 12 years of the also Gorman uh, World Cookbook Awards 2007. Uh, the book also received honorable mention in 2007 Arab American National Museum Book Awards. She also co-authored Beginner's Iraqi Arabic with two OGCDs uh, in 2005 and have been giving cooking classes and presentations on Iraqi cuisine among other, other books and projects and the blog, a very interesting blog. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nasrallah to AUB. Okay, so my task today <coughs> is to introduce the Middle Eastern aspect of the book, and in this uh, <coughs> the presentation, I would like to give you a taste of the book. The book we are celebrating today is about a subject that interests us all, food. It is impressively varied in the subject matter it covers on many levels, and the quality and depth of the research conducted is remarkable. Of its 15 chapters, I have chosen five chapters to tell you about, and the, the choice was uh, merely determined by the way I wanted to conduct the presentation. So here it goes. In the section dealing with dining in social contexts, we are first taken to Damascus back in the late Mamluk and early Ottoman period. The chapter is a vivid exploration of what it was like to be a member of an intellectual learned elite, a clique of ulama at the time, and how they set themselves apart from the non-learned civilian elites and the military administrative elites through their customary dining practices and discourses on table manners. Despite the scarcity of uh, sources available to us today dealing with these issues, the chapter does indeed succeed in pursuing them, exploring to the full what is available to us today. The chapter uses the several works of the indispensable 16th century Damascene scholar and historian Shamsuddin ibn Tulun and his book, Mufakhirat al-Khillan fi Hawadat al-Zaman, on events that took place in his time, and Fassil Khawatim on different types of banquets and feasts. <coughs> These are complemented with manuals on proper manners and dining etiquette in polite societies with all their do's and don'ts by uh, his contemporary uh, Abu al-Barakat al-Ghazi in his books Adab al-Muakala and Adab al-Ishra wa Dhikr al-Suhba wa al-Ukhuwa. They were indispensable resources on the art of, the fine, of fine dining in social contexts, treated in an amusing, often sarcastic way, of which the chapter offers us a taste. Here I'm giving you a vignette on how such gatherings were conducted by Ibn Tulun. The group was hosted by a friend to a day-long gathering they were first treated to some apricots brought to Damascus from the northern Syrian town of Hama. Soon after, they sat for lunch, and an even greater variety of food was served to the guests late in the afternoon. Between meals, the men passed the time by sharing poetry, literature, and various religious texts. One of the present guests recited a brief passage from the book, Virtues of Damascus, Fada'il al-Sham, after which another guest started singing the passage to a musical rhythm. 
Ibn Tulun then says that everyone present was deeply moved and some even burst into tears. Such an event, while self-serving as, as a strong social adhesive, it also demonstrates the attachment those local ulama felt towards their hometown. A distinct pride in local identity is also demonstrated in another book by Ibn Tulun, which is a history of al salihiyya It's a Damascene quarter where he grew up. Of its pleasures, the book enumerates its many fruits, vegetables, and culinary delights. Interestingly, a specific mention is made of a dish we now are all familiar with everywhere in the Middle East. It is laham ala ajin, what is also called sfiha. The book calls it laham ala ajin. And it is emphatically said to belong to al salihiyya Does this sound familiar? <laughs> the food wars? <laughs> On the authority of, of the renowned 15th century scholar and historian Ibn al-Mubarrid, who himself had a cooking pamphlet under his belt titled Kitab al tibakha it was said that a salihi guest should not be served laham ala ajin from places other than al salihiyya the host will have only himself to blame. Now we come to the second, to another chapter, also dealing with the social, uh, uh, his, I mean the social uh, situation, uh, dining situation at the time. A chapter with the title "Eaten Up" looks at the issue of dining as a social activity from another angle. It's the ambiance and its role as a cultural signifier in late Ottoman Syria. It was an interesting period when food practices and its consumption started to change rapidly with the beginnings of modernity, opening up to the West and the availability of a great variety of European style goods and kitchenware at affordable prices. The fast evolving culinary situation was only to be understood, the chapter argues, when not only the dishes are to be scrutinized, but also what surrounded them in terms of material culture, practices and discourses, particularly those promoted by journals like the popular Beirut-based Al-Muqtataf. Coinciding with this was the transition of the domestic physical structure from the multifunctional to the single function residential spaces, each with its own specific function. That is, they had dining rooms, they had bedrooms, they had all, all kinds. And how this, was in, how this in turn affected the kind of furniture used, changing from the flexible and mobile to permanent furnishings. Such changes, however, were, ex were, ex were expectedly attainable to those who could afford them, the rich and middle-income families, who were the target readers of a journal like Al-Muqtataf. It was a kind of a trend-setting lifestyle publication with its educational column on good housekeeping, Al-Tadbir Al-Manzili, on, redefined, on uh, refined manners and proper etiquette. To the readers of its time, it was what a medieval book on dining etiquette like uh, Adab al-Mu'akala we mentioned earlier was to his contemporaries. Not only that, the journal educated its exclusive readers on what uh, was new in dishes, terminology, merits of white bread, al-khubz al-frangi, that is European uh, bread, or uh, over brown whole wheat bread and the like. However, looking at the dining scene through a, a broader lens, the chapter cannot but conclude that the vast majority of the population lacked the, fun the, the financial means to introduce these new lifestyle practices. And while a sense of being modern among those who could afford them was instigated with the help of a new eating utensils and furniture, the well-established dishes of traditional 
Levantine cuisine continued to be served and, the, and remained largely uh, the same. As for the modern new foods, they were eating accessories. We leave the uh, larger scene, we come to uh, ingredients. Ingredients exploited in details. The ubiquitous onion and garlic are specifically targeted in chapter titled Peeling Onions Layer by Layer. They are rigorously explored throughout the Islamic world and beyond. The question the chapter poses is what can these ingredients whose presence dated millennia ago, tell us about Islamic societies. For an answer, the chapter looks at the ambivalent attitudes and conventions and discussions in Arabic classical texts, literary works, anecdotal collections, medical and pharmacological books and treatises, as well as hadith collections. <coughs> Garlic and onion were unsung heroes. While indispensable in the kitchen, and praises of their medicinal benefits were sung by physicians, the likes of Ar-Razi and Al-Jazzar, among others, in social contexts, they were mostly condemned and were better shunned. The culprit, of course, is no other than their pungent odor. They were, for instance, banned from mosques, or at least discouraged, and if eaten, then, for the love of God, just have them cooked. In one of the prophets uh, transmitted sayings, hadith, they were referred to as al-khabithayn, that is, the two vicious plants. Barbers were discouraged from eating them, and they were not even distributed as charity on the grounds that they cannot be eaten raw. The excursion the chapter takes to the anecdotes and proverbs and poetry featuring the garlic and an onion is an amusing one. Take, for instance, the heart generous Egyptian saying, an onion offered with love is worth a sheep. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, whether condemned or, accl or acclaimed, it was the form of the onion, after all, that inspired the architectural design uh, of the onion dome in Russia churches, or the Taj Mahal in India, which are said to have been influenced by the Islamic architecture in Samarkand, Iran, and even Samarra in Iraq. Um, now we have another ingredient, which is uh, hashish as food. The plant cannabis sativa marijuana was known from ancient times in the Near East where its medicinal benefits were mentioned in their uh, herbal records. In the Akkadian ancient language of the Mesopotamians, it was called qinnabu, from which the Arabic qinnab derived. By the Middle Ages, the herb was already known as the additive, uh, as addictive substance worthy of taxation along with wine, uh, misr, which is beer, and prostitution, and all came within the taxable category of al-munkarat, deplorable deeds, as we learned from al-Maqrizi's account of the Mamluks during the 13th century. But the beginnings of hashish consumption in the region was far from being deplorable. All contempor uh, contemporaneous reports on this herb tell the same story, that the Sufis were the first, its first users alluding to it as hashish and majun, and replaced wine with it. The chapter further explores the uh, contemporary issues regarding its dubious nature and its legality, um, and the main source used is Kitab Rahat al Arwah fil Hashish wal Rah. Uh, from this source, we learn how the herb was prepared and consumed. It was not smoked, rather, it was eaten as pills and sweetened preparations. The writer al-Badri is also credited for being the first to collect hashish-oriented poems and anecdotes where we see the budding images of al-Hashash, the, uh, the hashish eater. Here, later to be adopted in humorous literature. In almost all of the Badri's stories, food is mentioned, especially sweets. Uh, 
As for the dreams of the hashish eaters, they are lusciously vivid with lands entirely made, with, uh, made of sweets, which the chapter then associates with the western land of cocaine and the gingerbread house of uh, Hansel and Gretel. Now the last, uh, the last uh, section deals with uh, Abu al-Ala al-Ma'arri, who is on the other end of the spectrum. Um, 11th century Abu al-Ala al-Ma'arri, philosopher, poet, and writer. He lived ostensibly, uh, uh, esoterically, in uh, northern Syria during the Abbasids, till the age of 86. He abstained from eating meat and all related animal products, including dairy, eggs, and honey. He was what we nowadays call a vegan. He called it Saum dahr lifelong fasting. So how this was possible at a time when meat was revered and meatless dishes were called false dishes, muzawarat, only consumed for Lent and for the sick. For this, we read the chapter uh, Missionary and Heretic, where the issue of veganism in Islam is debated in what the writer describes as the best known and best preserved exchange concerning the subject between al Ma'arri and the Persian poet, intellectual, and Fatimid missionary Al Mu'ayyad fi Din Shirazi. In those exchanges, uh, Abu Ala al Ma'arri explains his, uh, why he abstains from eating these foods. This is his poetry I'm quote, quoting. Don't ever eat what the water gives up under a duress, or seek fare in the lonely slain, in the newly slain, or mother's fresh milk, purer than highborn maids, which they wished for their babes. Do not terrify carefree birds who know not what is done, for cruelty is the basest of evils, and shun thick white honey struck fresh early in the morning from fragrant blooms. How al Ma'ari was acquainted with the practice of veganism on ethical grounds is not known exactly. The chapter explores some possibilities that are still debatable, such as Hinduism and the uh, uh, Byzantine uh, influences. But veganism, veganism aside, temporary vegetarianism was common in the Islamic world due to the prevalence of the Galenic theory with the familiar um, medical practices of prescribing meatless dishes for the sick as they were believed to be lighter than ones, the ones made with meat, and also, of course, we have the land fasting for the Christians. They were all dismissively called muzawarat, counterfeit dishes. So I hope I gave you a taste of what the book is so that you can buy it. Thank you so much, Dr. Nasrallah. Uh, speaking of dish tasting and hashish, uh, there will not be a hashish tasting event, but I have a joke. I have a khabar from Professor Rosenthal from Yale University. Professor Rosenthal wrote, of course, uh, the famous book, Hashish and Other Drugs in Islam. So one day he was lecturing on hashish, and a student, we all have these students in our classes, raised his hand and said, Sir, have you ever tried the hashish? And so Professor Rosenthal said, um, mm, son, let me think. No, I don't think so. So the student said, how can you write a book about the hashish without ever tasting the hashish? This is unacceptable. So Rosenthal said, son, I have also written a book on suicide in Islam. <laughs> <laughs> so we move now to Professor Rebecca Earl. Well, thank you very much. What can I say following that? <laughs> can you hear me OK in the back? Yes? Okay, thank you. Well, it's an honor to be speaking about this wonderful book. So I want to start with a little vignette from September 2015 when BBC Radio 4's The Food Program, which is exactly what it sounds like, it's a radio program about food, they broadcast several episodes from the Zatari refugee camp in Jordan. The camp is home at present, I think, to some 78,000 Syrian refugees. And the BBC's food program was interested in investigating how the people living in this camp managed to feed themselves. But more than this, it was interested in how Syria's ancient food culture influenced the provisioning strategies of the international agencies who were running the camp. 
The program's presenters made clear that despite the loss of their homes and livelihoods, the camp's inhabitants had not lost their foodways. They continued to hunger for the flavors and the dishes of home, even though these were incredibly difficult to reproduce. Quote, food is extremely important to Syrians, more than it is for many of the people we work with elsewhere in the world, observed one food pro World Food Program employee. Syrians, he noted, I continue to quote, have a very, very advanced cuisine. And for that reason, they found it difficult to adapt to the monotonous, varied diet of camp catering. But the camp's inhabitants also had more specific objections. And the World Food Program employee illustrated this with a more concrete example. Residents, he said, quote, really didn't like the fact that we were using Jordanian spices because we had employed Jordanian cooks rather than Syrian spices. In response, the camp officials implemented a quite innovative series of reforms that made it easier for residents to exercise some control over what they cooked and how they ate. Far from vanishing in the face of calamity, Syria's rich food culture traveled with the millions of refugees displaced by the conflict, obliging even the UNHCR to change its practices. Well, none of this, I think, the importance of food to Middle Eastern culture and the specific ways in which culture is entwined with cooking, food, and politics, none of this, I think, would surprise the contributors to this wonderful volume. Insatiable Appetite brings together, as we've heard, 15 individual chapters which explore topics as varied as the status of wine and Umayyad poetic traditions to the contested nature of halal certification in contemporary South Africa. Food, as the contributors note, is a powerful cultural signifier in the Middle East and in Middle Eastern diasporic communities as it is everywhere. Perhaps, as the UN official interviewed by the BBC Food Program suggested, it's more important than in other places. I don't know. But in any event, Insatiable Appetite covers a remarkable range of themes, regions, and approaches to offer a brilliant kaleidoscope of foodways and foodscapes. And I'd like to make a few brief comments on the features that struck me particularly. I should say as a disclaimer that I'm absolutely not an expert in Middle Eastern history, nor particularly in Islamic foodways. But at the same time, many of the topics explored in these chapters touched on issues that will be familiar to anyone interested in food history, and indeed I think to anyone who, who eats, which I would hope is all of us. <laughs> And they draw on, these chapters draw on familiar categories of source material, poetry, novels, and other forms of literature, newspapers, journals, ethical and philosophical writings, photographs, travel accounts, folklore, just to mention a few. And contributors raise some universal methodological questions, such as whether prescriptive texts that tell you what you ought to do and what you ought to eat, to what extent can we use those to describe what people actually did, for example, and the chapters also explore the local versions of universal global processes, such as the rise of modernity, and how that's both a lived experience and a concept. So what did I learn from this book? Well, so what did I learn? I learned that plumpness can be a very positive attribute, right? Um, I learned that at the same time that in early modern Europe, Writers such as Erasmus and other Christian writers, at the same time that they were linking good table manners to what one scholar has called the civilizing process, so at the same time, important religious scholars in the early modern Islamic world also wrote books about dining and etiquette. So important food scholars, as I said, wrote books about table etiquette. Food, according to one of the contributors, was, quote, a very important subject for pre-modern Damascene intellectual discourse. People sat around and talked about table manners. And his chapter offers a catalog of disgusting habits that diners should avoid and that these religious scholars listed as things you shouldn't do, grab food from other people, scratch your head, etc. 
There's a very interesting chapter on a handbook for market, a market inspector from again, the early, middle, um, um, early modern period, which offers a fascinating window onto the world of market inspections, in which I learned that, for example, bakers in the Syrian markets were required to wear a face mask and shave their arms so that hairs and dribble and spit and you know, nasal discharge didn't fall into the bread. So I thought that was astonishing. At the same time, I also learned in one of the other chapters that saliva from your beloved is a highly erotic substance that more or less can substitute for wine in these poetries, right? So maybe you don't want the saliva of a baker in your bread, but you can talk about your, your beloved saliva as yeah, this, well, very erotic substance. A recurrent and very interesting theme explored in a number of the chapters was the management of conflicting food regulations from different religious groups. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, international, well, I mean, they're not just religious groups. These groups have their own food regulations. So too does the language of international development, of nutritional science, industrial food production. They all have their rules about food regulation, what people should and shouldn't eat. And they all possess their own truths for determining whether a food is healthful, right? and whether it's suitable for human consumption. And how these diverse communities, different religious groups, industrial food manufacturers, etc., how they navigate these different regulatory systems is an important and relevant question both for past food cultures and for today. So one of the very interesting chapters, for example, looks at halal food regulation in South Africa in which we learn that for some religious authorities, the tensions between the mechanics of industrial food production and the requirements of halal can be resolved. And that for other religious authorities, it is not so simple. And these chapters raise themes that are very relevant and interesting and familiar to scholars who study other parts of the world. So in the same way that we can, for example, talk, sorry, I keep moving away from the microphone. In the same way that we can talk about a global halal, as one of the scholars does, other historians and scholars study the emergence of what they call industrial kosher which has brought us such joys, for example, as kosher Oreo cookies and cream ice cream, eh? highly industrial product. The rise of global kosher, like global halal, has created an entirely new category of experts who can advise, for example, on precisely what temperature you need to heat a mechanized conveyor belt to in order to render it kosher, for example. So, and of course, those experts don't agree any more than the experts in South Africa studying halal regulations discussed in this book. Overall, well, I could keep talking about this, but maybe in the interest of, of time I won't. The point is that the dietary rules that underpin Islam and Judaism have been subject to constant reinterpretation and are today in the face of industrial food production. Ancient debates about food purity are intensely contemporary since today's food is entangled with long-standing ideas about religion, different food cultures, the economics of industrial food production, and modern food processing technologies. The chapters also document these entanglements of modernity in other ways. The chapters on vegetarianism and veganism show, for instance, that European ideas about vegetarianism have consistently drawn on Middle Eastern examples, either to demonstrate the merits of vegetarianism or to illustrate its supposed defects. And this was as much the case in ancient Greece, as we were hearing a little bit about, as it is or it was in 19th century Germany. These chapters remind us that there's a long history of vegetarianism and of learned discussions about its ethical status. And also, as Julia Hauser has shown in her very interesting chapter, opposition to meat eating by no means implied a necessarily positive attitude towards animals. 
Right? You might think it would, right? You might think vegetarianism would adopt a particularly positive attitude towards animals. But as you show, some of the people who criticized meat eating said, well, the bad thing about eating meat is it, it produces in you a horrible, bestial, animal nature, right? It arouses, you know, animal emotions, which are, you know, were bad. Right? So that was um, exactly the wrong sort of getting back to nature that you, you might acquire um, through eating meat. Well, modernity as well, um, this, these modern practices that have ancient roots, is an analytical thread for, in many chapters, you've already spoken a bit about dining room furniture and rooms, so I think I, I, will, I will skip over that. I, I, of course, there are many themes that the book doesn't chapter, doesn't chapter, doesn't tackle, Long-term dietary change isn't particularly something you look at, nor is there much discussion of agriculture, really. We learn a good deal about printed sources. There's less discussion of television or radio, modern forms that are very important today, I think, in disseminating ideas about eating. But it's very easy to offer this sort of critique of things that the book didn't cover. I think it's much more helpful to assess what this volume does. What I think it does is offer an exemplary collection combining research by early career scholars with work by some more established academics to illuminate many, of course not all, <coughs> of food's deep and varied history in the region. And I'd like to, excuse me, to have a drink of water. I'd like, <coughs> I'm so sorry. I'd like to end by returning to the, the Zatari refugee camp where I began. The final chapter in, in this collection um, resonates strongly with some of the voices from the 2015 interviews that the BBC conducted in, the, that, the, the, in Zatari. As the last chapter in the book, which, which is by Lola Wilhelm shows, food aid programs in the Middle East in the 1960s also involved quite a bit of negotiation between donors and international agencies and individuals on the ground. But in contrast to the situation in 2015 in the Zatari camp, in the 1960s, development programmers paid virtually no attention at all to the nature and appropriateness of the foodstuffs that they were distributing and which lay at the heart of these international aid programs in the 60s. And this sort of disregard of food's importance beyond basic nutrition was absolutely typical of the 1960s approach to development. I could give other examples, I won't. I merely want to say that the chapter identifies very clearly how in the 60s these international development agencies didn't really care about the culture that underpinned the food that was being eaten by the recipients of food aid. Well, how wrong they were not to care. All societies have complex and important relationships with food that greatly exceed the nutritional value of any particular food substance. This volume explores the specific and diverse relationships with food in a number of Islamic and Middle Eastern societies. It does so across a breadth of geographical contexts with an impressive chronological sweep. It offers an enormous range of topics, sources, and approaches. It's crammed with fascinating information. Food scholars and hungry people everywhere are indebted to the editors and the contributors, and we thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Rebecca. Uh, this was wonderful. Thank you also, Nawal, for this. The book can be purchased, of course, from uh, Brill Publishing uh, House. Uh, it's also open access online. Uh, it's available in paper, paperback and uh, hardcover, so both. Uh, we can take two questions from the audience. Please. Can you raise your about how sophisticated the Syrian cuisine is. Um, my question is, do you think that the modernization and the lifestyles of Syrian women 
can threaten the food culture and good like women are the ones who prepare the food and our culture and it takes a lot of time it's a full-time job so how do you think modernization can affect the cuisine Well, according to the chapter, um, I was glad to learn that, um, you know, um, it got to the conclusion that uh, traditional dishes, uh, you know, remained the same, but of course, uh, and the, um, you know, the newly acquired dishes were kind of accessories, but of course, that was in the um, late 19th, beginning uh, 20th century, well, well, modernity, uh, we see, uh, of course, now uh, it helps us a lot in, uh, you know, cooking those dishes in uh, uh, shorter times, less labor, which is uh, really a blessing. We keep our dishes, but we, with less labor, with less time. So, I mean, modernity is with us, not against us in this respect. Yeah, I mean, even there are, I, I've, I've seen even there are machines that can roll waraq al inab you know, all those small rolls. I mean, and, yeah, I mean, modernity and new, new technology is helping us to, uh, sustain, to, to keep those traditional dishes that we all love and cherish. There's a question from Mrs. Ibn Yasmin. Yes, My question is that we've heard that um, uh, food is very, very important, especially in the Arab world and for Syrians. My husband is a Syrian, and so I know about I speak, <laughs> and he's a very amazing cooker. Uh, my, my question is um, against the background that this is so important and so has so a long history. Um, did you find any signs that it could be contribute in conflict solution, in crisis? For example, maybe this is a bit uh, crazy what I what I say now, but could it be a contribute a contribution to to solve some political crisis and problems in Middle East? I ask because I know one of the diplomats I know told. Um, if we have working lunches together, then we hear to each other, and uh, we 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 hear in a good way, and that's why maybe this can contribute to conflict prevention also, and that's why it, it was a link that I thought about. Do you think it could be uh, possible, or did you find anything in the history that is a sign this would a good thing? Can I comment briefly on that? Well, so the, I have two thoughts about that. One is that whether sharing food together can prevent conflict is, is one question, but there are enormous numbers of local initiatives in many parts of the world that try to use cooking together as a way of dealing with the trauma caused by, by conflict. So there are many organizations, I know of many in Britain, for example, that, or, that try to organize opportunities for people who have been displaced by conflict to cook together and have spaces for interacting around food. So there's a kind of therapeutic school of, that associates food as a way of dealing with trauma. In terms of whether eating the foods of other people from other cultures reduces conflict and hostility, I think the jury is out on that. There's a very nice, I mean, I'm a historian, so I cite, you know, I cite articles. There's a very nice article on this that looks at attitudes towards Indian food in Britain combined with attitudes to people from from India. And it shows that there is very little correlation between people's enthusiasm for eating Indian food and people's enthusiasm for migrants from India. In fact, violence against people who work in Indian restaurants is a well-known phenomenon that the clientele who are happy to eat a vindaloo are also very contented to racially abuse the people who are serving them that food. So I think it's less clear that eating foods from other cultures necessarily leads to a more positive attitude in general to people from that culture, but That's maybe it can. Well, between two people. Yes, but I mean, 
between Otto Lenghi and his co. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, that's not, uh, uh, I mean, as far as medieval times, we have actually a book from uh, uh, Aleppo, which is Al Wusla ila Al Habib, the, I mean, the Taibat wa Tib. This is from, uh, this is an Aleppo cookbook written from uh, 13th century. Yeah, well, you see, I mean, um, you, I mean, so many cookbooks were, um, so many books were destroyed, uh, you know, in all those uh, centuries. And the fact that a book survived, it was uh, copied several times, there are several copies, it does, uh, you know, indicate that um, the, the cuisine was uh, popular, and uh, that's why they bothered to uh, copy them and uh, recopy them. Um, as far as the... Um, you know, pre-modern times. I'm not aware that there are, uh, uh, you know, uh, Aleppan uh, cookbooks. I only know that there is this uh, Ustad al-Tabakhin by Sarkis, which is uh, Lebanese. Um, so, um, I, I mean, perhaps, I mean, is, she is referring to the, uh, you know, the generations belonging perhaps back to the uh, 19th century or something, 18th century, and, but before that, it was documented. What is the name of that book? Ustad al This is Lebanese. The other one, Al Wusla ila Al Habib, Fi Wasf al Tayyibat wa Tayyib, by Ibn al Adim. Translated, published by the Library of Arabic Literature of Anwayu Abu Dhabi. By This is shameless promotion because I sit on the boat. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I've been hearing uh, a lot of uh, food and dishes uh, for the last two hours or so, and an event on food cannot uh, can only finish by offering food. <laughs> so. Thank you again. Thank you, Nawal. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Julia. Thank you for your attendance. Uh, and please join us in the reception. Thank you for the book. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much.